Hello, welcome. Uh, and I'm very glad to be here tonight. I've taken over from Tom Nixon to introduce tonight's speaker. My name is Susie Nash. I'm a professor here at the Courtauld. Um, and I wanted to remind you before we started that, of course, there will be questions after Emma's lecture. Uh, but if you want to ask them, you have to put them in the chat. We don't have any um, system, any other system than that, but I will certainly go through them and uh, do my best to uh, get through as many as possible. So, um, as I say, I'm delighted tonight to introduce Emma Capron. Emma is Associate Curator for Renaissance Painting at the National Gallery, a post she took up last March, just as the pandemic hit. So she's nevertheless, despite such challenging times, an exhibition already in the pipeline there on the compelling and mysterious portrait of the ugly duchess by Quentin Metzis, uh, which she's told me is actually now just been confirmed for spring 2023, which I'm sure we'll all be uh, dashing to when, when, it, when it opens, which doesn't seem that far away now. So I've known Emma as a student and a colleague for over 10 years and her talents as an art historian. Um, I have to say, are nothing short of dazzling, and uh, no pressure, Emma, of course. She first came to the Court Ord in 2010 to undertake an MA with me and returned in 2013 to write her PhD on the patronage of altarpieces in late medieval Avignon. As part of the meticulous research for this, but almost as an aside, she uncovered important documents concerning Simone Martini's last work in Avignon and she published these in the Burlington Magazine in 2017. She went on to hold prestigious fellowships at the Met and at the Frick, where as the Anne L. Poulet Fellow, she curated a small but exquisite and revelatory exhibition focused on their Van Eyck workshop Petrus Christus painting and the Charterhouse of Bruges for which it was made. And for anyone who saw that, you'll know how it was just a masterclass of how you could get the most um, astonishingly informative and beautiful exhibition in a very tight and very meaningful space. Today's paper takes us to another charter house, this one at Villeneuve Les Amnions, and the famous dramatic and complex painting made for it by Engrand Carton. Uh, Emma, I welcome you warmly, and I'm so glad you've come tonight to share your research with us. Uh, would you like to share your screen? So thank you so much, Susie, uh, for this incredibly generous introduction. I'm so glad you could introduce uh, uh, my seminar tonight uh, because you're the one who uh, shepherded this research from its inception. And it's really thanks to your support and acuteness that it took the shape it eventually did. And actually, you're the one who encouraged me to work on this altar piece when I was too scared to do so. So all thanks to you and all thanks to everyone joining us tonight on this glorious summer day. I'm really grateful to you for considering us spending another hour in front of your screen uh, instead of being outside. And I hope uh, I'll do my best to make it worthwhile. In the small corpus of French paintings from the 15th century, Enguerrand Carton's coronation of the Virgin occupies a canonical position. Not only is it one of the best preserved, most visually complex, and finely executed altarpieces to survive for the period, but it is also one of the best documented. Its contract reveals that it was commissioned from Enguerrand Carton on 24th of April, 1453 by Jean de Montagny, a canon from the Collegiate Church of Saint Agricole in Avignon to be placed at the Carthusian Monastery of Villeneuve les Avignon just across the Rhone from the Papal City. Specifically, the retable was intended for the altar of the Trinity that stood in the funerary chapel of Pope Innocent VI, who had founded the monastery nearly a century prior. The panel's dimensions were site-specific and it fitted neatly on the chapel's east wall, opposite the Pope's tomb. The contract is famous for the extraordinary length and precision with which it describes over 26 lengthy uh, items, the ambitious iconographic programs. It also stands out for its repeated acknowledgement of the artist's expertise and freedom to depart from this established plan as he saw fit. 
By bringing Carton's names to light, the publication of the contract solved issues of attribution. Discussions have still focused, have since focused on the altarpieces imagery, attempting to make sense on this, of this polling tableau. Much, if not all, the emphasis was given to the arguably unusual depiction of the Trinity, in which Christ and God the Father appear identical. Characteristic of the scholarship was an iconographic method notable for neglecting any information extrinsic to the image. The complexity of its patronage, its intended audience, and crucially, its physical location at Villeneuve Ch Charterhouse were consistently overlooked. These are the very issues that I will address this evening. In so doing, I argue that a grounded microhistorical approach, attentive to the work's context of creation and reception, proves more pertinent than the grand doctrinal readings that have held authority up to now. Before we begin though, we need to describe briefly what we see in this busy composition. At the center of the panel, a monumental kneeling virgin clad in a cloth of gold dress and blue mantle receives a bejeweled gold crown from the three persons of the Trinity who surround her tightly, almost enclosing her. Following the contract specifications, Christ and God the Father are indistinguishable as youthful bearded men and their poses mirror each other's. Emphasizing the group's symmetry, the dove of the Holy Spirit bridges the twin figures emanating from both their mouths. And it too participates in the coronation. And this is perhaps one of my favorite details in the entire Alger piece where you can see the beak of the dove almost fusing with the central point of the crown. Quite a wonderful uh, feat of design. The celestial court organized hierarchically flank these central figures. From the top, you can see angels, prophets and apostles, martyrs and confessors, founders of religious orders and female saints, the elect, and baptized innocent children. On earth are evocations of Rome and Jerusalem. On the outskirts of Rome is the church of Santa Croce in Jerusalem, where the mass of St. Gregory unfolds. Tucked in front of it, Moses beholds the burning bush. The valley, the valley of Josephat outside Jerusalem houses the virgin's tomb, attended by the patron Jean de Montagny and his brother Antoine, identified by his coat of arms. To the left, Bishop Guillaume de Montjoie, a friend of Montagny's, prays in front of the Holy Sepulchre. At the center of the composition rises a hill where Christ is shown on a thin elongated cross that bridges the terrestrial and the celestial. A lone Carthusian kneels in prayer at the foot of the cross. The underworld features limbo where the non-baptized innocents dwell and purgatory from which cleansed souls are rescued by angels. To the right, hell completes this expansive panorama. Carton made a few departures from the contract that bear flagging because they will be important for what follows. Importantly, he positioned the Virgin centrally, not to one side as the text implied, and he dressed her in gold and blue instead of white. He also added elements hitherto unmentioned in the contract, such as the Holy Innocence, and he reduced the number of female saints in heaven. Besides the Virgin, women are remarkably rare in the altarpiece. While gold is ubiquitous in the celestial spheres, eliminating the background and picking out endless details, it's entirely absent from the depictions of earth and the underworld, with the exceptions of the two miracles, the burning bush and the mass of St. Gregory. Also notable, apart from the damned, the lone Carthusian, and some rare exceptions among the celestial courts, every single figure is wrapped in contemplation of the divinity. All these choices will be discussed as we go along. Historically, discussion of the Trinity has dominated the scholarship on Carton's coronation. 
the representation of father and son under the identical guise of a youthful Christ with the dove of the Holy Spirit equidistant from them, its wings touching both their mouths, has consistently been described as extremely rare and even unique in the artistic production of the 15th century. In an influential article from 1963, Don Denny accounted for this presumed iconographic oddity by connecting it to the Council of Florence Ferrara. Responding to the growing Ottoman threat, the council's main goal was to reunite Eastern and Western churches by bridging the doctrinal differences that had separated them since the ninth century. A central point of contention regarded the origin of the Holy Spirit. The Latin church professed that the Holy Spirit proceeded from both the Father and the Son, a principle known as the filioque. While the Greeks believed that the Holy Spirit proceeded from the Father alone through the Son. At the council, complex theological debates led to an uneasy, hollow, and short-lived compromise, the decree of union promulgated on 6th of July, 1439. Then he argued that Carton's coronation gave pictorial form to the decree of union, accommodating visually both Eastern and Western interpretations of the Trinity. By depicting the dove emanating from both the father and son, the Latin principle of filioque was respected. But through the identical appearance of the two persons of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit seemed to proceed from one single principle, accommodating the Greek doctrine. Following this rather complicated line of argument, the altarpiece was to be understood as, quote, a rather complex vision of the church's newfound unity, end quote. Denis' interpretation was adopted by nearly all subsequent scholars, such that his hypothesis has gradually acquired the value of solid truth. François Besslug is one of the few to have challenged this prevailing view. He questions whether the mere fact of depicting the first and second persons of the Trinity as twins bearing the features of Christ would have really conveyed the Greeks' belief that the Holy Spirit proceeded from the Father alone, though identical, Father and Son nonetheless remain two very distinct figures. And the emphatic depiction of the dove emanating from both persons' breaths seems like a forceful assertion of the filioque. If conciliation were the intention, other Western treatment of the Trinity would have been far more suitable to the Greeks. For instance, this one, um, in which the dove seems to proceed from the Father alone down through the Son. To this, I would like to add that the Trinity was not the only hotly debated topic at the Council. Overlooked in previous literature, purgatory was another central point of contention. Although both Eastern and Western churches agreed on its existence, they diverged on the ways uh, the souls trapped in the third place could gain salvation. The Latins emphasized the needs for physical punishment and purification through fire. The Greeks defended moral torments and strongly rejected the idea that a material blaze could purge the immaterial soul. Reflecting those differences, the decree of union steered clear from making any direct reference to fire. Thus, the depiction of the purgatory as it appears in the altarpiece, full of supplicants consumed by flames and besieged by demons, would have been overtly antagonistic to the Eastern doctrine. Therefore, in its depiction of both the Trinity and the purgatory, the coronation seems to conform entirely to the Latin creed, offering no middle ground between Eastern and Western views. If the purpose of the altarpiece was indeed to celebrate the union of the churches, it seems unlikely that these two highly litigious topics would have been given such visual prominence. Further lacking from Denny's account is any consideration of the coronation's audience. The reason why an altarpiece intended for the enclosed Carthusians would display an imagery seeking to appease the Greeks is never addressed. Finally, from a purely iconographic perspective, the identity between father and son in 15th century Northern art is not as unusual as previously stated, especially if one looks beyond the medium of panel painting. 
With roots in illustrations of Psalm 49, it is found in French royal manuscripts of the early 15th century, in English alabasters, in Genbruge illuminations from the turn of the 16th century, as well as countless printed, carved, and painted examples in German art from the second half of the 15th century, all completely unrelated to the Council of Ferrara Florence. This iconographic survey thus undermined Denis' interpretation further. When depicting the Trinity, late medieval artists, patrons, and viewers clearly accommodated a wide range of visual solutions that need not be connected to a specific event or theological current. Like many other councils, that of Florence Ferrara had little discernible impact on religious imagery. Beyond the iconographic considerations, it's also worth recalling that the decree of union was a complete fiasco that failed to secure Latin military support for the Byzantine Empire, contributing to its eventual demise in 1453. It therefore seems highly unlikely that 14 years after the decree, and while Constantinople was under siege as a result of the council's shortcomings, Montagny and the Villeneuve Carthusians would have wished to commemorate this calamitous event by illustrating the decree's uneasy stance on, um, via Carton's altarpiece. So let us move away from an approach that considers images as rigid illustrations of religious doctrine, disconnected from the physical environment and context of creation, and instead examine the commission against the motivations, network, and interests of both Jean de Montagny and the Villeneuve Carthusians, as well as the monastery's history and wider decorative program. Let us first turn to the contract signatory, Jean de Montagny. He was the, the illegitimate son of a Savoyard number, a, a nobleman from Savoy with roots in Freiburg in the Holy Roman Empire. He grew up in the Val d'Ostin before setting off for Avignon to seek ecclesiastical benefices. By 1437, he was a canon at the Collegiate Church of uh, saint agricole in Avignon and an associate of Guillaume de Montjoie, Bishop of Béziers, also depicted in the altarpiece. What further information we have on Montagny derives from his will, drawn up on 27th of March, 1449. From it, we learn of his ardent devotion to the Trinity, in honor of which he had founded an altar and masses at Saint Agricole. Breaking with the established tradition for canons, the bulk of his funerary dispositions and benefactions was not directed to his own chapter, but instead to the Carthusian monastery of Villeneuve. Instead of Saint Agricole, he elected the Charter House as his resting place, and he asked to be buried in Carthusian habit. The will reveals Montagne's relationship to the monks to have been mutually supportive and deeply felt. Poignantly, he begged them to celebrate his commemorative masses not out of financial obligations, but out of love for him, non pretextu foloenis per amore thereby challenging the transactional underpinnings of late medieval commemorative culture. Montagny's interests manifest in many ways in the coronation of the Virgin. It is first evident from the altarpiece's Trinitarian theme. The particular decision to depict Christ and God the Father as twin figures under the guise of Christ, a visual tradition which, as we've seen, was popular in 15th century Germany, might originate in Montagny's roots in the Holy Roman Empire. His agency is also clear from the contract specification that Saint Agricole should appear in the celestial court, and from the inclusion of Montagny himself his half-brother Antoine, and his recently deceased protector Guillaume de Montjoie, himself a friend of the Carthusians, as donors at the bottom of the altarpiece. Through these diminutive, yet conspicuous figures, and they really appear at eye level when you stand in front of the altarpiece, Montagny cannily inserted his commemoration and that of his network in Innocent VI funerary chapel. The fact that Montagny drew up his will in 1449 has led Charles Sterling to surmise that he might have set off to Rome for the Jubilee and commissioned the altarpiece as a token of thanks to the Trinity upon his safe return in 1453. 
The, concern of, the concerns of the recently returned pilgrim might have motivated the inclusion of the two holy cities of Rome and Jerusalem in the painting's lower register. And I direct you to the really compelling article by Alexandra Gadzewski, which recently appeared in the Burlington on the topic of uh, the two cities. Though Montagny undoubtedly had input in the program of Carton's coronation, the canon's devotional interests do not fully account for this extensive tableau, especially its strong Marian inflection. For this, we must turn to Carthusian agency, as the monks undoubtedly retained control over the commission. Like most charter houses, Villeneuve was dedicated to the Virgin, and that can explain her prominence in an image otherwise destined for an altar of the Trinity. The limited female presence in the altarpiece might also reflect Carthusian regulations against the depictions of women within their monasteries. But to understand more precisely what placing this image in the Founders' Chapel would have meant at Villeneuve, a brief overview of the monastery's history and decoration, and the importance of Innocent VI in its visual and institutional memory is needed. The Villeneuve Charter House was founded by Pope Innocent VI in 1356, shortly after his accession on the site of his summer palace of Villeneuve les Avignon. In the bell uh, the establishing the monastery, Innocent made the funerary purpose of the foundation clear. It was intended to ensure, quote, the salvation of his soul and that of all the deceased faithful, end quote. Following this ambition, a vast decorative program, now almost entirely lost, was devised to commemorate the founder. A rare survival is the large portrait of Innocent VI kneeling in adoration to the Virgin and Child, which appeared on the lower register of the chapel of St. John the Baptist, frescoed by Matteo Giovannetti and his team in the mid-1350s. The Pope's portrayal was the first thing the monks would see when entering the chapel, um, which is the view you see here, and it was also visible from the refectory, providing the monks with a powerful reminder to pray for their founder's souls during their weekly communal meal. The other space explicitly linked to the Pope's memory was his imposing burial chapel, erected to the south of the church's apse beyond the choir screen. There stood his monumental chest tomb with its soaring triple bayed canopy. Before the revolution, Carthusian's mourners were visible around the tomb, providing a model of commemoration for the Villeneuve community to emulate. The tomb and chapel were further cannily positioned at the end of a dramatic perspective that originated at the north end of the large cloister, creating a visual apotheosis on the monuments for the monks as they walked twice daily from their cells to the church to celebrate the divine office. This carefully staged visual focused on Innocent's tomb was undoubtedly intended to recall the prestige of their papal founder, ensure that his memory remained ever present to the monks' minds, while also giving the monastery's preeminent work of art, the tomb, due emphasis. So, placed directly opposite Innocent's tomb, how does Carton's coronation fit within this commemorative program? Several clues in the painting's imagery suggest that it too was at least partly conceived to prompt prayers for the deceased founder. Indeed, a funerary theme threads through the altarpiece, emphasizing as it does the effects of prayers from the living on the dead's prospects for salvation. The inclusion of St. Gregory's Mass, in addition to exalting the Church of Santa Croce in Jerusalem, which was the seat of the Carthusian order in Rome since 1370, probably also alluded to the contemporary practice of testators requesting Gregorian Masses, a series of 30 low masses purportedly invented by the saint and believed to have great efficacy in hastening release from purgatory. And both Montagny and Montjoie um, requested those um, to be said at Villeneuve. Jacques Chifolo has noted that the presence of the Trinity, the Virgin, and the celestial court in the altarpiece reflects the standard list of intercessors to which the status recommended their souls in the preambles of their wills. In addition, 
The painting's lower register depicts two holy sepulchers attended by kneeling devotees, perhaps enticing Carthusian viewers to mimic the figure's stance and pray before the nearby papal tomb. Furthermore, the contract specified that popes be ubiquitous throughout the panels. And papal figures appear indeed as leaders of uh, the elect in paradise, as Satan's prisoner in hell, and as longing soul in purgatory. In a papal funerary chapel, it is certainly no coincidence that the soul shown exiting purgatory as a result of the lone Carthusian's prayer is that of a pope. Innocence commemoration also explains the contract's request that the altarpiece should, figure, uh, should feature Saint Stephen, as this was Pope Etienne Aubert's name, Saint Etienne and Stephen is the same name in French. The prominent inclusion of the innocent children unmentioned in the contract might constitute yet another important reference to the pontiff's name, Innocent VI. Such visual puns are not unprecedented in Carton's work. As I demonstrate uh, elsewhere in my thesis, in the Kadar altarpiece painted the previous year, when tasked to include the first line of the hymn Santa Maria Sucure Miseris on a scroll, but running out of space, the artist ingeniously used the figure of the Virgin to replace its missing verbal equivalent. These rebuses are in line with the tradition of counting arms in which the device illustrated on one's coat of arms has a direct relationship to the bearer's name. Frequently employed to paint coat of arms, painters were fully immersed in this emblematic culture, increasingly used such devices outside the narrow confines of heraldry. Famously, in his portrait of Jan de Loo, Jan van Eyck painted a lion, Loo in Flemish, in place of the city's last name. Having the holy children stand in for the Pope's name conforms to the vast majority of canting imagery of the period, which played on individual patronyms. And however innocuous they might appear to us today, these word plays served a strategic function when deployed in a funerary context, as they frequently were. They engaged viewers to utter the deceased's names. The ritual recitation of which, during mass, chapter, or special services, was a fundamental part of late medieval commemorative culture, and one believed to have great potency, as demonstrated by the urgency with which testators requested for their names to be inscribed in necrologies. Therefore, images were mobilized throughout the Vilna complex to perpetuate Innocent VI's memory, the monk's primary mission and duty, as stated in the foundation bell. These endeavors culminated in Innocent's chapel, dominated by his prominent tomb. In allowing Montagny to adorn the chapel, the monks complemented the monastery's pre existed commemorative apparatus. The devised an imagery centered on human salvation and the Carthusians' role in facilitating it, replete with visual triggers meant to elicit prayers for the deceased Pope. In doing so, they balanced Montagny's interests, for whom the memorial nature and the prestige of the chapel would surely have held great appeal, with an appropriate tribute to their founder. However, more was going on in this chapel. We learned from two 18th century descriptions of the monastery that Innocent's Chapel did not simply commemorate the Charterhouse's founder, it also celebrated the monastery's foundation story. According to these testimonies, quote, a Gothic plaque visible next to the founder's tomb explained the reason that led Innocent to establish the monastery. These accounts converge remarkably in their details. And we can be reasonably confident that they are faithful to the uh, original text on display. Yet frustratingly, neither transcribed the plaque's exact contents, nor did they give uh, more precise information about its specific position in the chapel relative to the tomb and altar. Instead, they summarized the story told by the plaque as follows. While still a cardinal, Etienne Aubert used to visit a hermit who dwelled in the hill near his Villeneuve Palace. 
On one such visit in 1343, Aubert witnessed the hermit wrapped in a vision, which the mystic then proceeded to recount to the cardinal, exclaiming, I saw wonders, I saw horrors. The hermit had seen the fates of the souls that had died that day. While the overwhelming majority of those souls were precipitated straight to hell and a few were sent to purgatory, only three rose directly up to heaven. Those of a bishop, a Roman widow, and a Carthusian prior. After having the vision verified, Aubert pledged to found a Carthusian monastery on the site, a wish he realized as soon as he was elected pope. Celebrated at Villeneuve, this legend was also ubiquitous in Carthusian chronicles, appearing under the pen of the Cologne theologian Heinrich von Kalker and spreading beyond monastic circles, as in Werner Hollewing's Fasciculus Temporum, a hugely popular timeline of the world, uh, which has been called one of the most widely disseminated books of the early modern period. Wonders, horrors, paradise, purgatory, hell, and the salvation of human souls. These correspond to the main elements of Carton's coronation. Given that the coronation stood in Innocent's Chapel, that is in the same space as this foundation plaque, it seems plausible that his imagery was designed to evoke the extraordinary vision of the afterlife that led to the monastery's establishment. Placed across from Innocent's funerary effigy, the altarpiece made the Pope a perpetual witness to the vision. Commissioned a century after Innocent called the first monks from the Grand Chartreuse to establish a monastery on the Rhone, the altarpiece emphasized the miraculous origins of the building of house, exalted the diligence of its papal founder, and heralded the Carthusian status as elect all aspects that the Villeneuve monks would have been keen to promote. And this propensity to expound and meditate on the specifics of each foundation and the personality of each founder as embodiments of the order's character, values, and purpose occurred in many religious orders. But it did with particular vibrancy among the Carthusians, as Julian Luxford has demonstrated. Assisting them in this task was a wide array, array of visual and textual material comprising chronicles, cartularies, tombs, heraldry, and crucially, images. And I'd like to add that this retrospective stance is also typical of 15th century Avignon, where the city's religious houses, most of them founded during the papacy, actively and self-consciously preserved, nurtured, and recalled the memory of their own past in the century that followed, using the altarpieces they commissioned as vehicles for the um, production of institutional memory. Placed in a space that effectively, effectively functioned as the epicenter of the monastery's memory, in the vicinity of a plaque recounting the hermit's vision, the coronation of the Virgin should be envisaged within this self-reflexing context as an inspired evocation rather than a literal rendition of Villeneuve's foundation story. The Villeneuve monks' interest in their visionary origins also speak to a broader Carthusian engagement with mystical experience and revelation literature, as their library holdings and copying practicing, uh, practices testify, for instance, their key role in the dissemination of the vision of Tundale. From St. Hugh of Chateauneuf to Denis van Rekel, many Carthusians themselves experienced visions, more so than any other orders, according to one of their late 15th century chroniclers who saw it as a sign of divine election. And this provides very fertile grounds for the commission and reception of a work like Carton's Coronation at the Villeneuve Charterhouse. When commenting on Villeneuve's foundation story, the 19th century Carthusian compiler, Charles Le Couteux, called on the writings of Bridget of Sweden. Bridget's work would have probably also constituted the closest proxy for late medieval Carthusian to envisage the Villeneuve hermit's vision. 
Indeed, the account of the countless visions Brinjet was granted throughout her lifetime were one of the most evocative and influential description of the heavenly realms and the underworld in late medieval literature. While Bridget's promotion by the Franciscans and the Dominicans has been very well covered, her reception by the Carthusians has received less attention. But Johannes Mangay and Dennis Martins have both shown that her work found a profound echo among the followers of St. Bruno, with the great Carthusian theologian uh, Dennis Van Rekel even singling out the revelations for providing Christians with knowledge of purgatory and its sufferings. The impact of Bridget's revelation on religious imagery has long been noted by art historians, her vision of the nativity in particular, but also beyond. So as a final proposition, I'd like to suggest that her vivid account of paradise provide um, intriguing parallels with Carton's coronation, and that they might have constituted a potential source for his evocation of the vision that presided over the foundation of the Villeneuve Charter House. In one of Bridget's most famous description of the heavenly realms, she receives a vision of the Virgin in paradise. Quote, Bridget saw the queen of heaven wearing a priceless and inestimable crown on her head with her wonderfully beautiful hair hanging down over her shoulders, a golden tunic gleaming indescribably bright and a mantle of the color of azure or of the crown sky. The Virgin in Carton's coronation, with her long blonde hair spread over her shoulders, her sumptuous gold dress, and her bright blue cloak conforms in every point to Bridget's description. This could be a coincidence, were it not for the fact that the Virgin's attire was modified from contract to painting stages, making her garment adhere more closely to Bridget's vision. The contract originally prescribed that the Virgin's clothes should be of white damask. Her gown was, was thus changed from Carthusian white to gold and she was given a blue mantle altogether unmentioned in the contract. This modification could of course have been prompted by visual demands. It allows the Virgin's attire to stand out more clearly against the white clouds. But a specific desire to reference Bridget's vision seems possible given other aspects of the painting's imagery. So the same vision continues with an apparition of John the Baptist, who explains the spiritual meaning of each of the Virgin's attributes. The crown signifies that she is the queen and lady and mother of the king of angels. Her hair hanging down signifies that she's a pure and immaculate virgin. The sky-colored mantle that she was dead to temporal things. The golden tunic signifies that she was ardent and burning with the love of God and both inwardly and outwardly. Her son placed seven lilies in her crown and between the, lily, the lilies, he's placed seven gems. The Baptist then goes on to explain that the seven lilies and seven gems with which Christ has adorned the virgin's crown each stand for a virtue with which he has endowed her soul. Although the connection is here a bit more tentative, in Carton's coronation, seven gems are visible on the band of the Virgin's crown. And in place of lilies, one can see seven stylized fleur-de-lis. In any case, the coronation would not uh, be the only painting taking inspiration from this specific passage of the revelations. The live lilies and seven gems that embellish the Virgin's crown in the Ghent altarpiece also derive from it. And the subject of Frangelico's paradise, in which Christ bestows a gilded pastilla orb upon the Virgin, was recently identified as Christ adorning her crown with one of the seven gems of virtue. It had been previously misunderstood as a gesture of blessing or coronation. Other telling parallels between the Virgin in Carton's coronation and in Bridges' Marian writings occur in her various discussions of the Virgin's place in heaven following her assumption, when, much like she appears in the altarpiece, she was, quote, raised wondrously high above all the heavens, giving her dominion over all the world, highest over all creation, the most beautiful creature of all, and the most like to God himself, end quote. Importantly, 
Bridget repeatedly emphasizes the Virgin's place in heaven in relationship to the Trinity as a whole, not in relation to God or Christ alone, as traditional accounts of the Virgin's assumption do, most famously in the Golden Legend. By contrast, in the Revelations, the Virgin explains to Bridget her position relative to the Trinity in the following terms. In return for my charity, God has drawn so close to me that whoever sees God sees me, and whoever sees me can see the divine and human nature in me, and me in God as though in a mirror. For whoever sees God sees three persons in him, and whoever sees me sees, as it were, three persons. For God has clasped me in soul and body to himself, and has filled me with every virtue. As with two conjoined bodies, the one receives whatever the other receives, so God has done with me. My soul and body are purer than the sun and cleaner than a mirror. Hence, just as three persons would be seen in a mirror if they stood before it, so too the Father and Son and Holy Spirit can be seen in my purity. Once I had my son in my womb together with his divine nature. Now he is to be seen in me with both his divine and human natures as in a mirror, for I have been glorified. This passage is striking for its insistence that the Virgin was drawn so close and clasped to the three persons, becoming almost conjoined bodies, which corresponds to her unusual position in Carton's altarpiece. It is also remarkable for its repeated description of the Virgin as a mirror in which God's, uh, both God's divine and human natures are reflected. The Virgin as mirror was a common metaphor derived from the Book of Wisdom, but while the biblical passage discusses the Virgin as mirror of God alone, Bridget insists on her quality as mirror of the Trinity. In Carton's coronation, the Father and Son appears like mirror images of each other, as though reflected in the Virgin between them. The well-known metaphor of the Virgin as mirror, expanded upon by Bridget, might therefore explain why Carton and his patron, of all the depictions available to them, opted for that in which, quote, between the father and son, there should be no difference. Bridget's writings are also relevant with regard to the use of gold in the altarpiece. In a revealing passage, the Virgin is compared to a goldsmith who fashioned her soul equated to gold through the fire of the Holy Spirit. Yet, quote, the art of the goldsmith cannot be clearly discerned so long as the object he has shaped remains shut up in a dark room. And likewise, the gleaming beauty of the virgin soul was not discernible on earth uh, as it was, quote, shut up in the hiding place of her mortal body. Only after her assumption did her soul, quote, come out into the true sunshine, the deity himself, then all the heavenly court exalted her with the highest praise. The profusion of gold in the virgin's garment likens her to a shimmering piece of metalwork, and the altarpiece captures the moment when its splendor is finally revealed. Yeah, this idea that gold is the preserve of paradise and cannot be seen on earth also occurs in another well-known passage of the Revelations, which describes the purification of the soul in purgatory as the process of separating copper from gold, gold being the only substance allowed to ascend. This dichotomy conforms entirely to Carton's choice of materials in the coronation. Indeed, he only used gold leaf in the celestial spheres, picking out everything from the angel's blonde locks and musical instruments to any depictions of metalwork, crowns, tiaras, or liturgical vestments. By contrast, he resorted to Latin yellow to convey gilt objects in the lower realms, with the meaningful exception of the two theophanies. Therefore, far from being a decorative caprice or a sign of archaism, in the coronation, Carton deployed gold in a strategic manner in order to enhance both meaning and experience uh, of the altarpiece. And I think the contrast between um, the, the top and bottom, um, the material contrast, would have been even more obvious under the flickering light of candles. Examination of Carton's coronation in the context of Bridges' visionary writings invites 
a reconsideration of the process of seeing as conveyed in the altarpiece, in particular of who is allowed to behold God. In heaven, the entire celestial court is wrapped in contemplation of the Virgin and the Trinity. In purgatory, souls look up longing for the sight of God they will eventually see. On earth, the donor's upturned gazes indicate they are privy to the celestial sight. By contrast, no one looks up in hell. The damned are forever deprived from beatific vision. Of special interest is the depiction of the unbaptized innocent children in limbo. Desperately looking up, but unable to open their eyes, Carton has powerfully conveyed their spiritual blindness as non-Christians. In sharp contrast with the enlightened state of the baptized innocents who in heaven rejoice in the vision of the Trinity. Except for the damned, the only figure in the entire painting who does not look up is the lone Carthusian at the foot of the cross. Deep in prayer for the salvation of Christian souls, he relies on his mind's eye to visualize the magnificent tableau above. The inclusion of Moses at the burning bush resonates particularly well in this context as this episode entirely revolves around access to the sight of God. Another visionary event takes place nearby with the man of sorrows materializing for uh, St. Gregory and his congregation of Carthusians to see. Never discussed previously, the prominence given to the process of seeing in Carton's coronation seems to confirm the validity of adopting a visionary lens to examine the altarpiece. Naturally, I don't mean to uh, say here that Carton's coronation is a straightforward illustration of Bridges' celestial visions. Rather, her text informed the way let medieval people imagined heaven, purgatory, and hell, and later provided a template for patrons and artists who, like Carton, were tasked to visualize the celestial spheres and the underworld. So to conclude, I hope to have demonstrated that when they commissioned the coronation of the virgins from Enguerrand Carton in 1453, Montagny and the Villeneuve Carthusians had more immediate concerns in mind than the Council of Florence Ferrara. For Montagny, the gift made to his Carthusian friends articulated his devotion to the Trinity, recalled his possible pilgrimage, and provided extraordinary support for his commemoration at Villeneuve. For the monks, the splendid altarpiece destined for their founders' chapels exalted his memory, their monastery's visionary origins sublimated through Bridget's vivid imagery, and the Carthusian central role in the economy of salvation. Yet the monks and the canon's vision only came together through Carton's masterful response to his ambitious and unusual brief. As the contract puts it, they were right to trust in the advice of Master Enguerrand. Thank you very much. Emma, thank you so much. Um, that was just so splendid and magnificent in every way and rich. And uh, there are already lots of questions coming in. Um, uh, I did, uh, we would all be clapping now, of course, if we were in the, you know, in the research forum in Vernon Square, and I'm sure you can hear those virtual claps sort of coming from um, all directions. Um, because it was just, there's so much food, food for thought there. And I obviously have heard, you know, a lot of this in, in different ways before. And every time I hear more and there's, it's deeper and it's richer. So, so thank you, uh, you know, so, so very much for that. I think it's a really impressive demonstration of how we need to make sure that we don't look just at this linear, you know, patron and artist. And when you actually step back and then you see the deep history and the context and the, you know, you're thinking about audience, but you're also thinking about function in a, in a sort of multi-layered chronological way, you know, not just the function of a chapel in 1450, but, but how it's worked going back. So anyway, I will, I will now um, uh, stop talking and go to some of the questions. Um, and while they're coming in, though I do, um, there's, there's quite a few. I have, um, as, as maybe I will just ask one because I do want to start this off. Um, do you think uh, that because um, 
that you know the whole idea of him of, of Montigny being able to commission this altarpiece for this chapel is it do you think part of the deal was actually that he was going to do something that was really commemorating the Pope and that it was actually that was how he got the ability to put his altarpiece there in the first place um I mean, that's, you know, we obviously don't have a, a lot of documents about it. it's not documented, but from from the snippets we have on, you know, from his will on their relationship, I, I think it's, you know, they, they probably, my, my, my kind of vision of this is that they came up about this program together some, somehow, and he, he would have had the the, fin the financial means and he he would have uh, proposed something particularly uh, exciting and and you know maybe also had already contacts with Carton who was active uh, in Avignon at, at this very point and had just done the Cadar altarpiece and so I see I see this is something where they it wasn't so much we'll only give you the space if you if you, if you give us something ground I think it's more like they, they wanted to do it together it could have been something um, that will let you uh, will give you burial rights also if you if you provide us with um, on top of your financial contributions with uh, something particularly grand that we want um, also because I think the monks had in mind that the centenary of the uh, monastery was uh, approaching at this point and they might have wanted something uh, to reflect on that moment so I mean that's yeah that's what I have in my about yeah, no, that, that, that makes perfect sense. Right, I'm going to turn to some of the questions. So uh, the first one in was um, from Joelle Costa, and they ask um, about the colours, I think, of the papacy, um, and are they reflected in the Virgin? They say here red, white and gold. Do you see, do you see a papal connection in anything to do with the colour choice? I hadn't uh, thought about that, but that's a really good point. Uh, I No, I've never connected it, because to me this, this seemed actually uh, rather um, you know, you, you do see that, I mean, virgins in, in, in gold, you see them especially in, uh, in assumptions uh, and coronations, but uh, often they're either completely in gold or in, uh, or, or, or in red and blue, but you rarely have the combinations of all three, so that's a very uh, good point, thank you, I'll, I'll take note of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then um, we have one from Clara Lutagi who asks, says, thank you very much for the presentation, was wondering if the mention of an inscription on the coronation's frame was relevant for the demonstration. Um, so I just, she's obviously asking about if there was an inscription on the frame and what relevance that is. So the, uh, something I didn't mention for in the interest of time, the, the uh, original frame is lost. It had also um, uh, um, what is called in Provence a superciel, which is this kind of uh, wooden structure to protect, it, pr that's convex to protect the painting from, from dusting. Uh, and it did have um, an inscription uh, that was um, in Latin that's recorded that we only know of uh, from the antiquarius uh, Strahez. And the, um, it was very much uh, Montagny uh, thanking uh, the uh, Trinity and presenting this image of the Virgin to the Trinity um, and begging the Trinity for, um, for, 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 the, for its protection, basically. So it's a language of gift given that made me also kind of think that perhaps there was something of a votive offering on Montagny's part to perhaps thank the Trinity for uh, having returned from his putative uh, voyages uh, to Rome. Um, so so that's, that's what was uh, written on it. And it also bore the date of 1454, which is when the, the altarpiece is completed. Okay, that's... Um... I think something that is is it's so frustrating, isn't it, that we don't have yeah. the original frame? That's yeah, yeah. one of those it, so often with paintings of this period that they, you know, they, they're they're fundamental, not just an an, uh, an add-on. I've got a question here from Peter Stalibras. It may be uh, useful for you to have a read of it because it's quite long, but it's asking about um, the first article of the contract um, emphasizes that there should be no difference, no difference between father and son at a time when such differentiation was already dominant in all artistic practices. So um, they're saying, I think his question is, why do you think that that's the very first article in the contract? Um, uh, I, I mean, my views is because the contract goes from like kind of top to bottom and, and, and more important to, to less important. So, so you start with the Trinity and the Virgin and then you go down and then you go, literally you can read the contract and go, go down in the altarpiece. That's, that's yeah. That. 
I think, I think that may, may be absolutely something to do with it. Um, right, we've got a question about uh, the, if there's any connection, any sort of oriental connection. Um, so, uh, this is from um, Helma Kyrtas, who says, uh, the Virgin's face is quite oriental and so is the pattern of the Virgin's dress. Can mm. you connect this with Eastern influences and materials? So the, as to the Oriental, I'll start with the face of the Virgin and then to, 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 to the brocade. Uh, the, uh, it's been called actually almost Chinese in early literature because of her, her eyes, her almond shaped eyes. Um, but I think actually, if you look at uh, especially sculpted examples of virgins from Northern France, uh, Charles Sterling's makes a wonderful um, comparison with the portal of the um, uh, Cathedral at Lens. I think, which and law is where a carton came from. Uh, it, I, I, they actually have this beautiful uh, versions with this quite, uh, you know, oval, uh, oval um, faces and pointy uh, chins and and almond shaped eyes. So, so I think it, it has more to do with that. And as to the brocade, I mean. Um, the trade in in in, um, in luxury uh, materials and fabrics, including uh, brocades from the east, was uh, was everywhere in Europe, and and then you see, I mean, it's 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 everywhere in paintings from the period. So I, I, it has more to do with with that kind of become a signifier of material abundance and profusion, as you would want the Virgin to look like, more than any direct reference to uh, Eastern connections. And actually, in fact, a, a fabric like that would be woven somewhere like Luca. Yeah. Rather than necessarily, it's it, 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 ultimately the, the influence may come from from the east. Um, I have a question here from Joanna Cannon. Uh, she says the fact that the lone Carthusian looks down is fascinating. Could you say more about this? Is he looking away from being dazzled, or looking at something specifically, the site of the monastery? Um, that's a really uh, that's a really really good question because and it's it's one that I mean you know there's almost a sense that he's imagining all this that it's all his vision, uh, which is interesting, you know, I, I, at some point I also thought is he the prototypical kind of hermit um, uh, who has this vision. Um, I think it, this has more to do with, um, you know, their kind of um, devotional practices in, in the cell to kind of use an image and, and then actually close your eyes and, and, and imagine it. But I don't have a kind of clear uh, definitive answer on that. It's something I grapple with, and it, that is quite fascinating indeed. I, it makes it more um, intense in a way, um, I think, because also I think the reason he's, he's, um, his um, aloofness or his, the fact that he's so uh, introspective also makes him the kind of like engine of the whole mechanics of salvation that we see unfold. It's his active praying that allows the Pope to come out of purgatory, that allows the souls to come up. So I think that might have to do with that. He's this kind of, yeah, engine. That's, that's wonderfully convincing. Um, so Laura Jacobus uh, says that she found the connections drawn with Innocent uh, VI and their writings of St. Bridget very convincing, but she didn't quite catch how the foundation myth was specifically referenced. Um, of the three souls ascending, one appeared to be pulled back by a devil. Is that something to form the hermit's vision? Is that um, something from the hermit's vision? Sorry. So no, so so the the way um, um, I mean I'm not sure I understood fully the question, but the 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 the, the vision is described in uh, the the archives of the of the monastery, and in um, in the uh, in, in, on the plaque, and and basically we only have secondhand accounts. The archives are no longer extant, and neither is the plaque. But if there was a plaque somewhere in the chapel. And uh, it, it recounted the story and the story just uh, went, as I said, there was no specific details of demons, etc. And I'm not, you know, I'm not, my argument is not that it's a literal rendition of the vision. I'm just saying, if you're a Carthusian at Villeneuve and you're looking at this, it would have, you know, reminded you of that, especially in the Founders Chapel in front of this inscription that talks about uh, visionary experience. Um, that that uh, presided over the foundation of the monastery, and um, so and the vision, you know, at the end of the day, is all about the course, what the Carthusians can do uh, in helping people uh, gain salvation. So, and that's very much what the painting's about. I have one last question, and that's all I'm afraid we have time for. Um, but it's also from someone called Capron. Uh, <laughs> it says, "Do the colors of the Virgin relate to the Virgin by Jean Fouquet?" 
uh, do the what? No, um, the colors of the Virgin relate to the Virgin by Jean. No, that has more to uh, that has more to do. I mean, the fact that she's uh, you know so uh, pale looking has to do with kind of courtly ideals of the days, and uh, as to uh, her colors, they're, they're pretty standard at the time. Thank you. I think on that note, we have to say thank you again, Emma. That was just uh, was so and um, uh, congratulations. And you've informed all of us. You've got some really very, very um, complimentary comments as well in the text, which um, I will save and pass on to you. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Good night. <laughs>